Hey guys, my name is Alex. Welcome to Therapia. All right, so first we're going to start off with a book by a Stoic named Seneca. And Stoicism is an old Roman belief, about over 2,000 years old, I believe. Um, this basically, it, it was a practical philosophy that a lot of Romans practiced that was basically meant to make you less of a pussy. That's basically what Stoicism is. It's just how to be badass and not be affected by things that make you sad. And to a degree, it's almost a little depressing because it seems to focus on the neut neutrality of your feelings, so you're not really supposed to be too happy either. Seneca was some kind of uh, senator or in some high-up government position way back when. I'm not sure exactly which emperor he was under, but he um, kind of uh, consulted the emperor known as Nero frequently, and then Nero had him killed. So I, did, I read the book, I Didn't Want to Kill Seneca, like, he's a little bit of a hypocrite in some parts, but, like, he's not... I wouldn't kill the guy. But, you know, maybe you would. Let's find out. When we have done everything within our power, we shall possess a great deal. But we once possessed the world. The earth herself, untilled, was more productive, her yields being more ample for the needs of peoples who did not raid each other. With any of nature's products, men found as much pleasure in showing others what they have discovered as they did in discovering it. No one could outdo or be outdone by any other. All was equally divided among people living in complete harmony. The stronger had not started laying hands on the weaker. The avaricious person had not yet started hiding things away to be hoarded off for his own private use, so shutting the next man off from the actual necessities of life. Each cared as much about the other as about himself. Weapons were unused. Hands still unstained with human blood had directed their hostility exclusively against wild beasts. He's saying that you, basically you never needed to evolve into a society because the earth provided everything you needed, um, as long as people were decent to each other and stopped you know, stealing crap and killing each other. That there's plenty of land, plenty of food for everybody. If everyone cooperated, it would have been totally fine. Um, I think kind of what he's saying here is like, everyone would prefer to live in the Shire. Like, wouldn't that be sick? Like, you just you just like give someone some like potatoes, and they give you like I don't know, like I don't know what's something you'd want. Like, I don't know, like a pumpkin maybe. And so you just you, you just have this pumpkin, you give them potatoes, and like you feel secure and stuff because everyone's like you're good at big happy. Everyone's just like a big happy family. And I think it's weird because I don't think many people would be like, nah, I don't want to live in the Shire. That seems terrible. And if you look at what people do on vacation and stuff, they do stuff that, that um, say, like, indigenous people used to do all the time. So now a vacation is you go hunting or hiking. And you're like, well, that used to be, like, just what you did every day back in the day. You just, you just go hunting and hiking. And that's how you live. So you're on a permanent vacation. Dwelling places given a simple countryman's finish. This was a home in conformity with nature. A home in which one enjoyed living and which occasioned neither fear of it nor fears for it. Whereas nowadays our homes count for a large part of our feelings of insecurity. I think homes do instill a feeling of insecurity because they're almost like our own personal little castles. And, and and I think people think of castles like keeps, like, you know, people break into homes because they know there's valuable goods in there. Like, the, there's no one who doesn't have anything in their house. Like, it's where we keep all of our, of our frivolous things. We need a place to keep our frivolous stuff. And additionally, now that our homes are so lavish and expensive, we have to get mortgages for them. And a mortgage, uh, the word mortgage is actually French for death pledge, which is the most metal thing I've ever fucking heard. And should probably be... Uh, a band like yo have you heard new death pledge but that's what mortgage actually means so you you now owe so much money for so much time and if you don't pay it you don't even have a home i mean if your home is made of like you know dirt and sticks like at least it's likely pretty cheap and then and you don't have to worry about someone taking it back because one it doesn't really have much value anyway um, if you don't make your payments which don't exist so i think this is more apt two thousand years later um, because we have such large mortgages now and, and so much value in our homes. Um, I don't actually know if they had mortgages back then. For some reason, that's something that I would like to research and know. But I don't know why. My thought for today is something which I found in Epicurus. Yes, I actually make a practice of going over to the enemy's camp by the way of reconnaissance. But, sorry, by way of reconnaissance, not as a deserter. A cheerful poverty, he says, is an honorable state. But if it is cheerful, it is not poverty at all. It is not the man who has... Too little who is poor, but the one who hangers after more. All right, so that's kind of a two-part quote. Um, so let's start off with the first part here, um, where he says, uh, today is something I found in Epicurus. Um, and then he says, I actually make a practice of going over to the enemy's camp. Like, I know a lot of people who are who are religious, but have never read, like, the you know, they say, I'm, I'm Christian. So, and you go, well, have you ever read any of the religion's books or whatever? Have you ever, like, considered Buddhism? Have you ever read any of that shit? And they go... No, like, this is the first thing I read and then I became it. Like, you know, like, I'm a libertarian, but I've read the Communist Manifesto. Like, it's, it's pretty ignorant to say you're one thing if you've never even done any reconnaissance, you've never read any of the other books. Like, it's just, it, it is, like, almost a definition of ignorant at that point. 
So you're probably wondering who Epicurus is. Uh, he's the head of, prob I'm going to guess, the Epicurean movement, which was similar to Stoicism, but it was um, different that the default mode of, an Epicure of the Epicurean belief is happiness. They want you to be happy, whereas Stoicism is kind of like they just want you to be stoic, just kind of like a badass. So it's a little different. They actually shared a lot of, um, well, obviously in this, in this, an example is this, where they kind of borrow from each other quite a bit, and the beliefs are actually very similar and very compatible. As a result, I mean, like, they kind of were at odds, but they kind of got along really well because most of the belief was, was similar. So here's Seneca commenting on the quote of Epicurus, A cheerful poverty, he says, is an honorable state. But if it is cheerful, it is not poverty at all. Basically meaning, like, if you're happy, you can't really be impoverished. Like, the whole goal of anything or requiring goods is happiness, so how could you be impoverished if you're happy? Um, so he says, it is not the man who has too little who, who's poor, but the one who hankers after more, which is completely true because, you know, you'll never get there. It's a never-ending journey to keep collecting a bunch of shit you don't need. Um, you should, I need hardly say, live in such a way that there's nothing you could not as easily tell your enemy as keep to yourself. You know, that reminds me of stuff like office gossip and, and a, a very stoic belief is you shouldn't talk be behind people's backs and stuff like that. Like anything you say to anybody, um, you should be able to say right to their face. And that is just, the, you know, the definition of integrity and character. And, and I think that that if you really if you really want to be known as like, you know, there's there's people that everyone loves and they typically act like that. Like they never say anything bad about anybody. You probably met one of those people in the course of your lifetime. I know a guy named Chad that everybody loves, like ever since university, he's I don't think he's ever said a bad thing about anybody. And as a result, everybody trusts him. Everybody loves that guy. Everybody loves Chad. So be like Chad. Also, this reminds me of, um, if you read the book Principles or even just watch the TED Talk by Ray Dalio, he owns the uh, Bridgewater uh, hedge, hedge Fund. And in their business model, it's very different than other businesses. They operate with radical transparency and radical openness and all that. And you can actually criticize openly any coworker without fear of, um, without any fear of being completely reprimanded or fired or anything like that because they believe that it's better to, you know, to actually be honest about your problems and, and work on them rather than just have them kind of fester inside you while you're just pissed off that everyone is doing a terrible job, but you're not allowed to say anything about it. Um, so that's kind of like the same line, the same line of thinking where, you you know, the radical radical honesty and openness does, does help. Um, and it does get your point across. It's good to have people know how you feel. It's not, it's like showing feelings and stuff. I, don't, I never believe that that's a weakness. I think that's actually a strength. I think it's really... I think it's very healthy for people to be able to tell other people what they think of them and stuff like that. Um, society kind of shuns it a bit. I think that we should probably get more into that. More openness um, and, and communication. I think it's very important now that everyone's you know hiding behind cell phones. It'd be great if people were, were able to communicate better. So that's what that quote kind of made me think of. Does that mean we are to act just like other people? Is there to be no distinction between us and them? Most certainly there is. Any close observer should be aware that we are different from the mob. Anyone entering our home should admire us rather than our furnishings. It is a great man that can treat his earthenware as if it was silver, and a man who treats his silver as if it was earthenware is no less great. Finding wealth an intolerable burden is the mark of an unstable mind. So I think what, what Seneca's saying here is it's not like a symbol of progress to be kind of like a shutout from society and stuff like that. You really do kind of want to integrate, I think, especially if you're trying to persuade someone. It's really hard to persuade someone if they can't relate to you at all, like you're just doing like weird hermit stuff. And they're like, I don't get what you're doing or how this life is better than what I'm doing. Um, I think that's a little bit what he's getting at. Um, also, I think he's saying that you can have nice stuff and, you, you know, and someone who treats like, you know, so, someone who has little but treats it like it's worth a lot is the same as someone who has a lot and treats it like it's worth little. Like it's not, that's not what makes someone like a great person. So Seneca also says here, finding wealth an intolerable burden is the mark of an unstable mind. Uh, what I think he means by that is basically... You should be able to be wealthy. Like you should, it shouldn't drive you crazy to have things. Like if you have the Lamborghini and it's just making you nuts because you're just like, you can't handle it. That's also not good. Like you should be able to actually tolerate being rich. Like appreciate what you have, but then, you know, also be able to appreciate not having it. That's kind of like, I think what he's saying here, the, probably the best situation to be in. Thus it is that foresight, the greatest blessing humanity has been given, is transformed into a curse. Wild animals run from the dangers they actually see, and once they have escaped them, worry no more. We, however, are tormented alike by what is past and what is to come. A number of our blessings do us harm, for memory brings back the agony of fear, while foresight brings it on prematurely. No one confines his unhappiness to the present. He's saying here that animals are basically lucky because they only have to worry about exactly what's in front of them, whereas humans worry about stuff that's already happened and is about to happen, and that's almost, he's saying that's a curse because, you know, it doesn't really make you very happy. It, it does stop, it stops you from living in the now, which is very important 
Um, you're really the present's all you have. Like you don't really have the past. You don't really have the future anyway. You only have the present, so you might as well you know, do what you can because, you know, it is an irrational fear to fear things that have not or to worry about stuff that has not happened or might not happen. Like that doesn't even make sense. That's just going to make you unhappy. And I think it takes serious mental training to kind of um, stop doing that. Like the prefrontal cortex is very powerful and almost everyone has a general anxiety. And I can tell you from experience, it takes a lot of time to train that out of your mind. Like start now. If you have general anxiety, start meditating, start trying to train it, start trying to get rid of it. You'll be a lot happier because I mean, like, you just have all these irrational fears, not going to help you, not going to make you successful. Okay, so this was the next one I found. A single example of extravagance or greed does a lot of harm. An intimate who leads a pampered life gradually makes one soft and flabby. A wealthy neighbor provokes cravings in one. A companion with a malicious nature tends to rub off some of his rust, even on someone of an innocent and open-hearted nature. And I think Seneca makes a good point here, and it's like, if you want to be successful, hang around successful people. It's like that quote, poor people should buy rich people dinner. Because, you know, that's how you become rich. You gotta, you gotta get with those people and you gotta hear what they have to say because they're the ones doing the actual actions that are resulting in that kind of success. If you hang around people that are lazy, you'll become lazy. A wealthy neighbor will make you jealous of what he has and stuff like that. Um, I think that's kind of like why monk, monks just move away from everything. You don't want those influences if you can avoid them. You want to hang around cool people or people that are good at what you're trying to do. Um, you know, there's a, I think it's called the zone of proximal development. If you're trying to learn something, hang around people who are, hang around people who are really good at that, and you'll learn it very quickly because you're surrounded, you're in that, you're immersed in that environment, um, optimized to learn that kind of skill or behavior. So there's the second part of that quote: retiring to yourself as much as you can, associate with people who are likely to improve you, welcome those whom you are capable of improving. The process is a mutual one. Men learn as they teach. And I think like I'm not sure if this is accurate. I think Feynman had a quote like that, where the best way to learn something is to teach it. Obviously paraphrasing, but I think that really does. I think that is really apt. Like, if you want to know what you don't know, try and teach someone something. And it becomes glaringly obvious. Like, the things you thought you knew, um, and, and it turns out you don't, like, you'll know exactly what those are. And welcome those whom you are capable of improving. That's a very stoic belief. I think it's, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to argue that that's not the correct thing to do. You know, treat others how you want to be treated. Obviously, if you can help someone out, uh, do it. So the next quote here is, We think these things are ours when in fact it is we who are caught. The track leads to precipices. Life on that giddy level ends in a fall. So it's basically saying, you know, no matter how rich you are, um, it'll end. Everything ends. So it's kind of like if you're going to be, if your desire is to be really wealthy or whatever, just make sure you're ready to be not wealthy because, you know, you, you can't sustain that. You can't make profit forever. Like everything acts dynamically. There's always ups and downs. I'm sure you've noticed in your life that, or all of our lives, obviously, that, you know, some days are good, some days are bad. Um, in any business, you have good quarters, you have bad quarters, stuff like that. So if you're gonna, if you're going to go for that, just be ready to have, you know, to have it taken away. And and then when that happens, you're expecting it, and it's not nearly as bad. This next one is Seneca quoting a verse by, I think it was Polybius or something, like some famous poet from back then. Doesn't really matter. Um, if you pray a thing may, and it does come your way, tis a long way from being your own. And that, I think that's pretty apt. Like if you just, if you win the lottery, you're not a millionaire. You don't behave like a millionaire. You don't have you don't have the aptitudes of a millionaire. You're just a, you're just basically a poor person unless you were rich first. Like then you know that's cool, and then you'll know how to handle the money. But most of the people that play the lottery are are broke ass people <laughs> that are bad at. Oh, this is gonna offend so many people. Broke ass people that are bad at math, basically bad at probability. And it's like Jim Rohn says. If you don't know who Jim Rohn is, uh, look him up and watch his videos. He's super cool. Um, if you, if someone gives you a million dollars, you best become a millionaire really quick because otherwise you can't keep the money. Um, so if you look at most millionaires, I'm not talking about people that are just bizarrely rich, but most people that have actually earned a few million bucks in their life, they're mostly good savers. The reason they're millionaires is they don't spend much money, um, which is kind of counterintuitive, but that's, I guarantee you that's accurate. They actually live frugally and they save money. Um, and that's how they get there. There's also that other thought that if you take all the money in the world, I'm not sure who said this, but you take all the money in the world, you divide it up evenly into the population, and it, it would end up in the same pockets it already was. That's just a, a theory, obviously, hard to prove that. But I think that one's probably right as well, and I think that it is behavioral. Being rich is a behavioral thing. It's, it's not luck. It's not random. All right, this next quote's pretty sick. There is a need, in my view, for someone as a standard against which our characters can measure themselves. Without a ruler to do it against, you won't make the crooked straight. And I think that's that's pretty that's pretty cool. I think we need to look at other people and measure up against them to figure out like what what are they doing that's different than what I'm doing. Um, you know that makes it a lot easier to figure out what your goal is and what you actually want yourself to be like. 
Um, so if I was thinking of Stoicism, probably two guys that I think represent Stoicism that aren't actually Stoics. One is uh, Jeff Cavalier from Athlete X. I think that guy's awesome. He seems to really want to help people with his knowledge and stuff like that. Makes tons of videos on, um, on weight, basically weightlifting stuff and physiotherapy stuff to help people. I mean, he makes money at it, obviously, at the same time. But it's really cool that it does seem like his main drive. If you, he seems very sincere about it. And it, like, that's, that's, I think that's really cool. He's actually make it, made a career out of helping people achieve goals and stuff and pushes them and wants them to do it. Another guy is, uh, that I would admire is Carl Sagan. And he made the, I can't remember the name of the show right now, I think it's Cosmos that Neil deGrasse Tyson did. Carl Sagan had, did that originally and actually taught Neil deGrasse Tyson and stuff like that. And if you watch Carl Sagan's version of Cosmos, it's uh, super cool and, and it, you know, it's eighties, but it's still super cool. And he was just a rad dude that wanted the best for the world. And he was head of, can't remember what the space project's called. I'm pretty sure that most people would know this, but it's the one they shot with the golden disc on it. It's outside of the solar system now. Um, there's the two of them that they launched. Can't remember the name of it, I'll just write it on the screen. But uh, yeah, he was a pretty cool dude. So there's some of the rulers I would measure myself against. I would think, would Jeff Cavalier or Carl Sagan do this? And then I would act accordingly. All right, so the next quote here, Seneca's talking about um, basically uh, frivolous treasures and stuff like that. And he's saying, all these things will only induce in you a craving for even bigger things. Natural desires are limited. Those which spring from false opinions have nowhere to stop, for falsity has no point of termination. When a person is following a track, there is an eventual end to it somewhere. But with wandering at large, there is no limit. So give up pointless, empty journeys. And whenever you want to know whether the desire aroused in you by something you are pursuing is natural or quite unseeing, ask yourself whether it is capable of coming to rest at any point. If after going a long way, there is always something remaining farther away, be sure that it is not something natural. So he's using this argument... Um, in terms of uh, wealth again, but he's saying that if don't don't do things that have no ending because you can't really win or be happy doing them. And this is kind of a modern phenomenon that's occurred recently where, where people have figured out um, in the gaming industry that you can make games that never end and people basically play them forever. And it's kind of possibly not a very healthy habit because you just keep going and going and it never ends. You never do anything else. You just kind of like you know, you're just always kind of, it's almost like just drugs. Like you're just doing a bunch of drugs and you're craving all the drugs all the time. Um, so he's saying that anything that just doesn't have a clear ending is probably not something you want to pursue because you'll never win. Like there's no end goal. It's just going to keep going forever. For me, like the mastery of anything is very strange to me because I think like, you know, you could try and be like the best chemist in the world or the best biologist in the world, but I'd personally rather be a biochemist. I think they're probably more useful. They're going to come up with more interesting ideas. Instead of trying to be like the Olympics makes no sense to me. Like it's crazy for one person to dedicate their entire life to one craft. Like it's just like that's insane. Especially when there's eight billion people. And like, you know, it is it, in my opinion, it's better to just I think it's more useful to society to be a unique person than someone who's the very best at something. And I think those pursuits are a little frivolous, like and, and I mean, there is an ending to becoming the best, you know, Olympic whatever in the world, but it's unlikely. Next quote here. Set aside now and then a number of days during which you will be content with the plainest of food and very little of it and with rough coarse clothing and will ask yourself, is this what one used to dread? It is in times of security that the spirit should be preparing itself to deal with difficult times while fortune is bestowing favors on it, then is the time to be strengthened against her rebuffs. In the midst of peace, the soldier carries out maneuvers, throws up earthworks against a non-existent enemy, tires himself out with unnecessary toil in order to be equal to it when it is necessary. If you want a man to keep his head when the crisis comes, you must give him some training before it comes. So what he's saying here is you always be prepared for the worst and when times are the best. And this is kind of the stoic belief. It's like when you're having a good time, and this is different between them and the Epicureans basically, is you're having a good time, that's when you should be preparing for it to end. And, and what he's saying here is one way you can you can basically remove your fears of, of, um, of poverty is just live in poverty. Just take all your shit, get rid of it for a few days, and live like the worst you could possibly basically do and once you do that you go well you know so this is the worst that can happen i can live like this you know you've confronted a fear now and you're no longer afraid of of the, this fear so you're kind of um mentally you're gonna be a lot better off you're not gonna be anxious about it anymore you know exactly what the stakes are so for example maybe you're thinking of quitting your job but you don't want to because you don't know what happens when you have no money or or you have to live you know suboptimally to what you want you try it out and you go, oh, wow, this isn't so bad. I can handle this. And then you go back and you go, hey, I'm quitting my job. I'm going to go do what I actually want to do. This is another quote basically re-embellishing this uh, one main idea of Stoicism here. For no one is worthy of a god unless he has paid no heed to riches, 
I am not, mind you, against your possessing them, but I want to ensure that you possess them without tremors, and this you will only achieve in one way, by convincing yourself that you can live a happy life even without them, and by always regarding them as being on the point of vanishing. So, you know, just, just restating that, um, you know, you can own stuff as long as it's not owning you, and uh, if you lose it, be, you know, be ready for that and be able to be happy even without it. And that's basically what he's saying there. It's good, good stuff. And this is Seneca's one, one of his more famous quotes here. Uh, of this one thing, make sure against your dying day that your faults die before you do. So basically, you know, this is a continuous process. Always be working on this stuff um, and try, try and become, you know, as perfect as you can before you die. So in the next quote here, Seneca's talking about some of Socrates' teachings. Uh, Whatever your destination, you'll be followed by your failings. Here's what Socrates said to someone who is making the same complaint. How can you wonder your travels do you no good when you carry yourself around with you? You are saddled with the very thing that drove you away. So basically saying that your geography is not going to solve your problems. You got to be confronting your problems where they actually are. And your problem is probably you. So you have to confront yourself, realize that you can't just, you can't just move further away from your problems. You actually have to solve them because that's the only thing that's actually going to, you can't enjoy, you won't be able to enjoy traveling unless you do that because you're, you're always there. All of your problems are still there. You're still the same person that made those problems, gone into those situations. So it doesn't help you to just run away from them. That probably makes it worse because then you're not even confronting your problems. You're looking for some form of escapism, which is kind of well, very anti-stoic and stuff. You know, you should deal with your problems straight up. So here's another quote that's almost a continuation of the last one. Once you have rid yourself of the affliction there, though, every change of scene will become a pleasure. You may be banished to the ends of the earth, and yet in whatever outlandish corner of the world you may find yourself stationed, you will find that place, whatever it may be like, a hospitable home. Where you arrive does not matter so much as the sort of person you are when you arrive there. I think that's just a very good and concise summary of the whole idea that, um, you know, it's just who you are when you get there that matters, not where you're going. Next quote here, Seneca saying, I do not agree with those who recommend a stormy life and plunge straight into the breakers, waging a spirited struggle against worldly obstacles every day of their lives. The wise man will put up with these things, not go out of his way to meet them. He'll prefer a state of peace to a state of war. It does not profit a man much to have managed to discard his own failings if he must ever be at loggerheads with other people's. So that's Seneca basically from 2,000 years ago being like, don't be super dramatic, you know, don't, don't purposely make your life difficult. You should, you should try and live as peacefully as you can. Uh, and he's basically just saying that's the correct way to live your life. It is time I left off. Not before I have paid the usual duty, though. A consciousness of wrongdoing is the first step to salvation. This remark of Epicurus is to me a very good one. For a person who is not aware that he is doing anything wrong has no desire to be put right. You have to catch yourself doing it before you can reform. Some people boast about their failings. Can you imagine someone who counts his faults as merits ever giving thought to their cure? So to the best of your ability, demonstrate your own guilt, conduct inquiries of your own into all the evidence against yourself. Play the part first of the prosecutor, then of the judge, and finally of the pleader in mitigation. Be harsh with yourself at times. So what Seneca's saying here is it's very hard to reform yourself if you're not aware that you have any faults. And so you need to, every time you're doing an action or thinking of thought, you need to assess it and, and determine whether or not you think that that's an acceptable thought or type of behavior um, before, you, before you do it. And then you can slowly over time improve yourself. Um, but you have to be your own worst critic in, the, in that sense. And then you can become better and, uh, and uh, live a better life, basically, is what he's getting at. So next up... But in the case of a grown man who has made incontestable progress, it is disgraceful to go hunting after gems of wisdom and prop himself up with a minute number of the best known sayings and be dependent on his memory as well. It is time he was standing on his own feet. He should be delivering himself of such sayings, not memorizing them. It is disgraceful that a man who is old or in sight of old age should have a wisdom deriving solely from his notebook. Zeno said this. And what have you said? Clenthes said that. What have you said? How much longer are you going to serve under others' orders? Assume authority yourself and utter something that may be handed down to, to posterity. So I think what Seneca is saying is he's trolling me from 2,000 years ago and just calling me like an idiot for just actually just taking his quotes verbatim and then telling them to you. Try and synthesize the things you're given into something that's greater than the sum of its parts. Try and improve upon the things that you've learned um, and, and then come up with something else that's valuable. So don't just never produce anything like a sponge. Don't just suck up all the water, but make water. Really bad analogy. Very bad. Going with it. Next quote. Words need to be sown like seed. No matter how tiny a seed may be, when it lands in the right sort of ground, it unfolds its strength, and from being minute, expands and grows to a massive size. Reason does the same. To the outward eye, its dimensions may be insignificant, but with activity, it starts developing. 
Although the words spoken are few, if the mind has taken them in as it should, they gather strength and shoot upwards. It's kind of like that, that Chinese proverb that's fairly common, I believe. What's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. What's the second best time? Now. Um, like, if you want to develop skill sets, start now and it'll branch out over time. Like, there's no guaranteed way to become successful, but you can really hedge your bets if you just start something now. Personally, if you don't have any hobbies, start programming now. You'll have, in 20 years, you'll branched out. Maybe you'll be a blockchain type programmer. You'll, you know, you'll have all these skills and stuff. But if you don't start now, none of that happens. And that's why you got to start now. Uh, what doctor can heal patients merely in passing? So, I, you know, that means that you, if you're going to dedicate yourself to something, you really have to dedicate yourself to it. Otherwise, it doesn't really work. You're going to need, like, for these videos and philosophy, you can't just watch this video on philosophy one time and have it actually make any difference in your life. You have to watch, you have to subscribe and watch all my videos. That's clever, but no, but I mean, like, you do have to actually put in a serious effort into improving your life if you're going to do that. You have to read the books, you have to, like, do the work. It's just like going to the gym. It takes serious effort over time to get the results. I don't know if I mentioned that every single thing in this book is just letters that Seneca wrote to his friend Lucilius. Um, so if you see Lucilius in any of the quotes, that's just because he's writing his buddy. So this quote goes, For unless I am mistaken, we are wrong, my dear Lucilius, in holding that death follows after, when in fact it proceeds as well as succeeds. Death is all that was before us. What does it matter, after all, whether you cease to be or never begin, when the result of either is that you do not exist? So this is just the weird stoic fascination with death and, and, and they're, they're, they're rampant about overcoming the fear of death. It's like super important to them. Like they admire people who are executed like in a cool way. Like they cut half your head off. I don't remember the guy's name. They cut half a guy's head off and they put his head back on the chopping block and Seneca just thought that was the shit. And he's like, oh, that's so cool. Basically what he's saying to Lucilius is you didn't exist before. You won't exist soon. It's the same difference. So just be chill with it. Next quote here is, Let a man retire and the common crowd will think of him as leading a life apart, free of all cares, self-contented, living for himself, when in fact not one of these blessings can be won by anyone other than the philosopher. He alone knows how to live for himself. He is the one, in fact, who knows the fundamental thing, how to live. I think this is kind of important because we don't actually teach philosophy in schools really, except at, you know, a like university level or whatever. And, and so, like, there's not really any instruction on how people should be living their lives. They just, they just uh, become molded into whatever society makes people um, without any, without people really thinking for themselves of, of whether that's how what, what actually makes them happy or how they actually want to live. Um, so he's saying that even if you retire, if you never actually researched or like researched from philosophy, which used to be practical and used to be, you know, all about how to live your life. And nowadays it's almost like all about philology and like kind of like logic puzzles and stuff, which is kind of different. And uh, in my opinion, much less useful. Um, that you will not be able to be happy because you just you just don't know how. This is just a really interesting quote here. Supposing someone lost his one and only shirt in a robbery, would you not think him an utter idiot if he chose to bewail his loss rather than look about him for some means of keeping out the cold and find something to put over his shoulders? You have buried someone you loved, now look for someone to love. He was consoling Lucilius who had a friend die. Uh, I can't remember his name. What, what he's really saying here is... Um, it's more, it's more rational to, instead of dwelling on someone's death, to go and try and, and, and find someone else to, you know, give the admiration and love you were giving to your friend previously. It's better to find a new friend than to mourn the loss of the old friend. Which I think is, is difficult, but I think it's rational. Next quote here. Nothing makes itself unpopular quite so quickly as a person's grief. When it is fresh, it attracts people to its side. Find someone to offer it consolation. But if it is perpetuated, it becomes an object of ridicule. Deservedly, too for it is either feigned or foolish. So basically what he's saying here is, you know, don't be sad for too long, otherwise you're either foolish or you're faking it, uh, because in his opinion, people just don't, people just aren't sad forever, like you do get over everything, so. And especially if you know you're gonna get over it eventually, you might as well rationally try and be over it now because the end result's the same anyway. Another quote here, as it is with play, so it is with life. What matters is not how long the acting lasts, but how good it is. It is not important at what point you stop, Stop wherever you will. Only make sure that you round it off with a good ending. What, what Seneca is saying here is basically you want quality over quantity with life. Uh, it reminds me of a quote by I think Churchill, which is um, a ship is safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are built for. Very similar type of quote where it's kind of like, it's kind of like, yeah, you can live like a safe life or whatever, but it's not going to be the best life. And you, what you actually want to be doing is living, you know, the best possible life and just well, this also reminds me of like a uh, Memento Mori. If you've ever seen one, it's just like a coin that Stoics, I, I don't know if they used to actually carry them around. I think they did. 
which is just a coin or whatever that you keep in your pocket or whatever that reminds you that that you will die eventually, basically. Stoics and they're just death fetishes again. Um, yeah, so you have this coin, and I think... So you, you can still get these today. I think there's a website called like the Daily Stoic that, that still makes Memento Moris or whatever, and there's there's different ones you can get. Um, and basically, it's just in your pocket, and whenever you you know whenever you pull it out, it reminds you. It's like, oh, you could die soon. So you're just like, well, maybe I should do something before I die. Just don't let anyone see it because they're gonna think you're insane because you're carrying around a coin in your pocket that says you're going to die. So there's that too. All right, next quote here. There are two things then: the recollecting of trouble in the past, as well as the fear of troubles to come, that I have to root out. The first is no longer of any concern to me, and the second has yet to be so. And when a man is in the grip of difficulties, he should say, there may be pleasure in the memory of even these events one day. I think this is a really good quote because it's kind of like the youth is wasted on the young type quote where you should appreciate um, things now because eventually you will. Like if you're in good health now, you might not be in good health later and you're going to wish that you could come back to today and uh, and and appreciate it. I think it's a, a part of the human condition to... Um, almost normalize everything. Like you get a raise and you normalize it. Like you appreciate it at first and then you become, you become uh, like desensitized to it. And I think that we, we get desensitized to the things we should appreciate, like our health and the, you know, our ability, our ability to you know do things and our freedoms and stuff like that. Um, and it's kind of, it's kind of sad that it is our condition to not be able to continually appreciate all the things we have. Otherwise we'd be like stupidly happy all the time, which would be awesome. I think, cause maybe I'm an Epicurean, who knows? So basically, no matter what you're going through, appreciate it if you believe it could get worse. And uh, I think for most of us, it probably can get worse. So uh, yeah, try and appreciate your life. Where is the glory in mere capacity? When the victory rests with you, when all the company lie prostrate around you, slumbering or vomiting, declining all your calls for another toast, when you find yourself the only person at the party still on your feet, when your mighty prowess has enabled you to beat all comers and no one has proved able to match your intake, a barrel is nonetheless enough to beat you. I like this quote. I'm not exactly sure of the exact meaning of it. I think it's just saying like there's some things you don't really want to win at and um, that you really can't win at. Like, you know, there's some endeavors that are not very healthy for you that no matter if you're better than everyone else at them, it doesn't really add much to your life, I guess is what he's saying here. I don't know. It's just kind of a kind of a cool quote. Next time I'm completely wasted, I'm going to find someone who's even more drunk and then be like, you might out drank me, but you can't drink the keg. He'll be like, wow, I never thought of it that way. I need to change my life. Here's another another quote that kind of gets back to the idea that maybe philosophy has a place in school. Uh, so Seneca says here, What use is it to me to be able to divide a piece of land into equal areas if I'm unable to divide it with a brother? What use is the ability to measure out a portion of an acre with an accuracy extending even to the bits which elude the measuring rod if I'm upset when some high-handed neighbor encroaches slightly on my property? The geometrician teaches me how I may avoid losing any fraction of my estates, but what I really want to learn is how to lose the lot and still keep smiling. I th he's saying basically, why should I be able to measure an acre, but I shouldn't know how to divide it with my own brother? And uh, I think by brother, he means, you know, like fellow man or whatever. And I think he's saying that, the, you know, the, the things they should be teaching are not really just, just um, you know, things that, that lead to success or wealth. It's the stuff that, you know, how to deal without having wealth is, is what he's basically getting at there. The next quote is, The scholar Didymus wrote 4,000 works. I should feel sorry for him if he had to merely read so many useless works. In these works, he discusses such questions as Homer's origin, who was Annie's real mother, whether Anacreon's manner of life was more that of a lecher or that of a drunkard, whether Sappho slept with anyone who asked her, and other things that would be better unlearned if one actually knew them. It's almost a 2,000-year-old jab at reality TV and stuff where you don't want to learn things where the actual answer or the information is actually useless in the end anyway. So who the bachelor marries in the end is useless information that you now know. So why, why do you know that? What is the benefit of knowing that? It's, um, and, and so it's kind of a warning against that kind of thing where you're like, where instead of doing stuff like learning philosophy or something cool like that, you're learning things that actually have no application at all. And he calls that a useless work. And I mean, it kind of, kind of is. All of your work has amounted to nothing because the answer never mattered. All right, next up. There's no justification for using our graves and all the variety of monuments we see bordering the highways as a measure of our stature. In the ashes, all men are leveled. We're born unequal, we die equal. So this is more of the stoicism kind of death fetish. We, we once you're dead, it doesn't matter thing. Uh, so you go, we're born unequal. So, you know, you're a king, I'm a slave. Uh, but in the end, we're just going to be ashes. So we're equal. 
and uh, just kind of another way to say that. So there's no justification to give yourself a tombstone. You don't even exist anymore. So, you know, it doesn't matter. Are you never going to give any of these considerations any thought and never going to apply any healing treatment to your wounds? Instead of sowing the seeds of worry for yourself by hoping for this or that, or despairing of obtaining this or that other thing, if you're sensible, you'll run the two together. And never hope without an element of despair, and never despair without an element of hope. So basically it's saying, you know, like, learn to deal with your expectations. You know, you, you, should, never, you should never get too ahead of yourself. You should never be too down on yourself. Just more of that stoicism logic, just keep it steady, and, and you're just, you're good to go. Next quote here. When she created us, nature endowed us with noble aspirations, and just as she gave certain animals ferocity, others timidity, others cunning, so to us she gave a spirit of exalted ambition, a spirit that takes us in search of a life of, not the greatest safety, but the greatest honor. And I always thought, I always thought that was interesting, because biologically and evolutionarily, you know, you have the urges of self-preservation, but at the same time, we have guys getting into rickety, untested spacecraft in the 60s and flying to the moon. Um, and that is probably one of the least safe things that you could do and would you think would be totally against our programming. And that's what makes this quote very interesting is, is there's, there, even 2,000 years ago, they realized like, there's something else going on here. It's not just self-preservation. It's just like this weird thing that we do. I don't know why. I, don't, I have no idea why that is. It seems so weird. If anybody knows, tell people. So wherever you notice that a corrupt style is in general favor, you may be certain that in that society, people's characters as well have deviated from the true path. In the same way as extravagance in dress and entertaining are indications of a diseased community, so an aberrant literary style, provided it is widespread, shows that the spirit from which people's words derive has also come to grief. I think that possibly is an indicator of a diseased uh, community, that we all just text people in like pictures and stuff that actually don't say anything. Because when you start communicating pictures, the, the explicit meaning of it is very vague. So say you're hanging with your friend, and then you're like, hey man, what's up? And he just gives you like sunglasses, smiley face, like, nah. And you're just like, what the fuck? It's like, that was really weird. Like, you didn't actually communicate anything. But for some reason, if you do it over a phone, it, be, it becomes some kind of legitimized form of communication where no one's actually saying anything. Maybe I'm looking into this too much, but maybe it's because everyone's afraid of, being, of saying the wrong thing or doing something wrong. So that if the, vag the more vague they can be, the less responsible they are for the things that they have or have not said. Maybe that's it. I have no idea. So continuing on. There are things that we shouldn't wish to imitate if they were done by only a few, but when a lot of people have started doing them, we follow along, as though a practice became more respectable by becoming more common. Once they have become general, mistaken ways acquire in our minds the status of correct ones. Nobody travels now without a troop of Numidian horsemen riding ahead of him and a host of runners preceding his carriage. Yeah, I've noticed like a huge jump in the number of Numidian horsemen riding ahead of carriages. I don't know if you, that's just me, but that's, that seems everywhere these days. All right, Seneca continues on. Pleasure is a poor and petty thing. No value should be set on it. It's something we share with dumb animals. The minutest, most insignificant creatures scutter after it. Glory is an empty, changeable thing, as fickle as the weather. Poverty is no evil to anyone unless he kicks against it. Death is not evil. What is it then? The one law mankind has that is free of all discrimination. So basically what Seneca's saying here is that we should not just be hedonistic and doing whatever feels pleasurable at, at the time. Uh, any animal can do that and we're above that. Uh, so he's, he's saying that that's not what you should be doing. But I think uh, in accordance of, uh, with nature and stuff like that, I don't really see why we wouldn't be doing that. Maybe on an Epicurean or whatever, but to me it seems more natural to just go along with our instincts and programming than it is to kind of go right against them and say, you know, this thing that every creature does in the world um, you know, is not natural. Like, and that's, to me, is bizarre. So he continues with the typical Stoic mantra, glory is an empty, changeable thing, as fickle as the weather. You know, don't get used to uh, success, don't get used to riches, blah, blah, blah. Um, Poverty is no evil to anyone unless he kicks against it. Okay, what he means by that is, like, you know, if you are prepared for poverty, um, it's fine. If you're, if you're really sad that you're impoverished, it's, it, you know, you're bringing, you're willing it onto yourself. Your perception of the event is what you're sad about, not the event itself. So if there's an event that occurs, like you being in poverty, nothing's actually changed. It's just you're perceiving the poverty is bad and that's what's making you sad. But if you perceive the, po the poverty is neutral or fine, then you'll be happy. And that's another stoic belief. Death is not an evil. What is it then? The one law mankind has that is free of all discrimination. So he's basically saying, you know, death, again, inevitable, get used to it, gonna happen. Philosophy has no business to supply vice with excuses. A sick man who is encouraged to live in a reckless manner by his doctor has not a hope of getting well. And what that means to me is it's, a, it's kind of a warning from Seneca to avoid, 
using philosophical beliefs to encourage vices, which is almost, probably a jab at like almost Epicureans, basically, where they you know their philosophy is to be is to is to seek pleasures and stuff like that kind of. So he's saying that like you know that's just that's an, an excuse to um, to to have a vice, um, and he's saying that if your philosophy is not good. Um, you don't have a chance of living happily because it's just it's going to lead you totally astray and you're not going to get well, so to speak. And I think that's it uh, for quotes I found in uh, Letters from a Stoic by Seneca. Hopefully my improvised analysis was beneficial to somebody. And as I am not a doctor that can heal you in one passing, you're probably going to want to subscribe to the channel because then you'll be alerted when there's more videos and then maybe it'll get you into philosophy and then it'll change your life. Who knows? It won't just be philosophy. There'll be a lot of success-related material what is success, how do I achieve success, etc. Um, so if you like that stuff, there'll, there will be some. I'm pretty sure it's going to be a really long video, so I commend you for watching all the way through. So good work. I'm proud of you. And uh, with that said, I will now stop.